don't know Spider Robinson personally, uh, but I have uh, studied some statistics um, that follow in his wake, and uh, I learned a few things about him in doing my research. Uh, the first surprising thing is that he is by uh, original craft a choreographer. Did any of you know that? A dancer, a teacher of the dance, uh, but he has also published 29 books, 10 different languages, short stories and newspaper columns galore. And I do know this, because I've read the newspaper columns and some of the books. He's funny as hell. Spider. Thank you. Pardon me. Sorry, Mr. Copeland. Uh, I was born and raised in New York, and I survived the 60s. I've looked down enough gun barrels. I did bring cheat sheets. I also brought visual aids. <laughs> Copies of books one might want to purchase. And I do have to make a small correction. Most, I'm afraid the research department that you, you're working with is about as good as the one I've got. Uh, it is my wife who is the choreographer and dancer. <laughs> if I didn't seem particularly graceful coming across the stage, that's why. <laughs> I have three left feet. Uh, good evening, gentlies and ladlemen of the audio radiance. I'd like to thank you all for coming, or however you're reacting. Um, I am Spider Robinson, the H.G. Wells of the Stone Age, and I'm here to uh, tell you that here at Idea City is a good time to reveal the news that the, the chemical which causes ideas, the, the chemical which creates nerds, has been identified by a chemist named Lisa Simpson, and she has named it Point Dextrose. <laughs> I'm probably best known for a series of uh, bar stories uh, that take place in the kind of bar where if a Martian walked in and ordered a beer, they'd give him a, uh, give him a beer and leave him alone. Uh, I'm connected most closely with a quotation I'm wearing on my back right now on a t-shirt, which I would show you if I were not wired up to a microphone. It reads, shared pain is lessened, shared joy is increased. Thus do we refute entropy. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed, but if you've got a hurt and you share it with me, somehow we end up with less than a half a hurt apiece. And to me, that's the reason why the universe isn't such a bad deal after all. The second quote I've lately become associated with is a group of librarians in Texas who are presently fundraising by selling t-shirts on which is written the slogan, Librarians are the secret masters of the world. They control information. Don't ever piss one off. <laughs> That's mine too. Um, librarians are rather important in my life. If it weren't for a librarian, I'd probably be working for a living today. Uh, when my mom got tired of reading me Lone Ranger comic books around the time I was five or six, she took me down to a, what seemed to be a church from the way she was acting called a library. And she pushed me through the door and said, look for a nice lady behind a desk and tell her to give you a book. So I looked around until I found a desk with a nice lady behind it and said, mommy says, give me a book. And this woman whose name I have failed to learn after years of repeated attempts handed me a copy of Robert A. Heinlein's Rocket Ship Galileo. It was the first of a series of books Mr. Heinlein wrote specifically for juveniles, for children. And yet, although it was written for children, Heinlein was the first adult I had ever run into in my whole life, other than my mom and dad, who didn't talk down to me, who didn't treat me like an idiot, who assumed that I could follow along, and that if I, there were a few words I didn't know, well, I could keep going and learn the meaning from context. Uh, I went back to the library and said, you got any more by this guy? And they took me to a place where all of the books had a, a hydrogen atom being impaled by a V2 on the spine. This indicated, for some reason, that they were science fiction. And this was so far back that if a science fiction book had been published in hardcover, it was very good. And if it had been purchased by a library, it was terrific. Because back then, we were a, the sort of despised ghetto we're becoming once again. And so I speedily learned that the, the science fiction section of the library was the place where the quality to crud ratio was the highest. Nowhere in the building did you have such a guarantee of excellence as you did in the science fiction section, because they didn't really want that crap there in the first place. <laughs> so if they'd been forced to, it had to be reasonably good. What the hell is science fiction, then? Um, it's 
awfully easy these days to confuse it with something that comes out of Hollywood called sci-fi. Uh, sci-fi, those of you who sp who've taken Latin know, is the plural of scum-fum and refers to scum-fum <laughs> Hollywood. Uh, a, a terrible moment in history came when Star Wars came out and became a multi-billion dollar phenomenon because then lots of people pointed spotlights at us writers of written science fiction and said, that's what you do, right? And we all started to say, no, that's not what we do at all. You notice Mr. Lucas called that a space fantasy. Ours is a different. But then we thought, how much do we want to disassociate ourselves from a billion dollar phenomenon? <laughs> so we kept our mouths shut with the result that now the average citizen is of the opinion that science fiction is stupid. It's, it's, it's uh, cowboys and Indians for morons. And I really can't blame them, considering what comes through the tube all the time. My generation, we had our eyes on the stars. This generation seems to have its eyes on the movie stars. Well, written science fiction, if you don't know, is the, is the literature that exists to answer one of, th to complete one of three phrases. The classic one is, what if, dot, dot, dot. The other one we do real well is, if this goes on, dot, dot, dot. The grim warning, unless someone does something, this is going to, the result will be. That's probably the best known kind of science fiction among the general public. The kind I like best is the third kind. Isaac Asimov said, sometimes the sentence begins, if only, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. And it's, it's when guys write stories that begin, if only, that other people pay attention, and the next thing you know, you're walking on the moon. Science fiction is, is the literature that's supposed to stand between the poets and the engineers and get them talking. God knows we need more poets. God need, knows we need more sensible engineers, because look at some of the dopey things they're bringing us these days. Science fiction is the literature that acknowledges that there is a future and is willing to discuss the interface between technology and man. Well, no wonder it's not terribly popular nowadays. Technology is not very popular. For a list of ways in which technology has not improved modern life, please press one. All right? You all know what I'm talking about. Is it, it, I got an email a, a couple of weeks ago from a man who said, I hate my computer. I hate all computers. The people who thought of these things should be shot. It was signed Jeff Raskin. Jeff Raskin is the man who thought up the Macintosh. <laughs> he was the original head of the Mac design team until it was yanked out of his hands by the money guy, by the man who wanted to be a multi-billionaire and rushed out there on the market before it was ready. And that's why generations later, you and I are cursing our machines rather than smiling at them. I'm addicted to computers now. I can't go back to a typewriter. I have nightmares of being forced to be committed to keystroke, committed to paper with every keystroke and using correct type and all that foolishness. But on the other hand, since 1984, when I bought my first Macintosh, I've probably sunk over $30,000 into the damn things. And today I own a machine which is not as effective and functional as the Fat Mac I had back in 1984. I could turn the switch on that sucker and be typing in 45 seconds. Now it takes me about five minutes. I don't know if this is necessarily progress. Progress has not been much popular these days. The folks don't want to hear about it. I heard there's a fellow who lives outside of Los Angeles named Al Nino, who's been getting death threats. <laughs> it's all his fault. Well, computers weren't really technology, folks. That was, that was technology that had been hijacked by the greed heads. Uh, and about the only way you can guard yourself against things like that is to uh, read a lot of science fiction. You have a clue what's going on. Uh, fantasy is, unfortunately, the thing nowadays. Uh, the bestseller lists have been un unequivocal for the last four or five years at least. If you look at the top ten fantasy and science fiction best-selling titles in the newspaper of the field, Locus, or for that matter in the Amazon.com sublistings or the Walden books or the Dalton, almost month after month without exception, uh, fantasy is eating our lunch. More than five of the top ten will involve elves and dwarves and unicorns and swords. And of the remaining three or four science fiction titles, at least two of them will be Star Wars or Star Trek tie-ins. I don't know why it is, but the reading public, at, just as the millennium has arrived, just as technology is beginning to really prove itself, hell, just as we all now depend utterly on technology and can no longer live without it, the reading public seems to have decided that they no longer want to contemplate anything great-grandfather couldn't or didn't. Well, you really want to go back to great-grandfather's time? I thought I did once. That's why I'm here in Canada. I came here in the early 70s at the tail end of the hippie movement because like a number of other hippies, I wanted to go back to the land. I wanted to become one with nature. I wanted to find out what it was like to live without that technological civilization. 
And one of the first things I learned was that I am not competent to make my own axe heads. <laughs> and, uh, I can't make chainsaw parts. I can't even put together a decent shovel. <laughs> it gave me a very firm, firm understanding of how desperately and totally we depend on technology. And folks, it's way too late to go back. If you want to live in great grandfather's world, well, you're going to have to share it with about four billion rotting, stinking corpses, because that will be the side effect of throwing away technological civilization, is most of us now alive will die. We're committed. And I don't see a problem with that. I, I was born with bubbles on my lung that caused them to collapse every so often, just like bubbles on a bald tire. I would overstrain somehow, and a lung would go down, and I would spend a couple of months on my back staring at the ceiling and cursing. Uh, then I happened to land in the high-tech hospital where they had people who were interested in experimental medicine and they did the procedure that fixes that and I haven't had a lung collapse in 20 years now. Um, 10 years after that I was being stupid in the kitchen trying to separate two cups over the sink with a steak knife and <laughs> managed to snip completely through my extensor tendon. Now what I love more than just about anything else you can do uh, out of bed is play the guitar, and I, I had just ruined myself as a guitar player. I no longer had an opposable thumb on this hand. I went down to the hospital in total despair and found out that a week before, someone had invented a way to reconnect tendons like that so that it would work. Thank you, Doc. <laughs> uh, for a more recent example, last month, uh, laser surgery kept me from losing this retina. One day, I, uh, for no reason at all, I discovered that my left eye was full of chicken soup. Uh, globs of chicken fat and little specks of pepper. I went to my doctor to find out about this, and he said, geez, get downstairs to the laser right away. And they were able to successfully repair my eyeball with the result that I am now binocular as I blink out at you. I'm all in favor of technology. I think that uh, while the world has many, many severe problems that we must address, that the best way to address them is to get rich. <laughs> Fortunately, this turns out to be not all that difficult. Uh, endless riches are hanging right over our heads. It's, it, 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 if it weren't for the absence of gravity, it would be raining soup. Uh, I think we all ought to get rich. Yes, we've made a lot of messes here on this planet, but did you ever notice that it, in the rich neighborhoods, they keep their lawns up real good? <laughs> you know, there's the poor folks that got three or four trash cars out there on the lawn and, 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 a, and a bunch of junk. I'm one of them. <laughs> I want the human race to get rich, and for that, I think we're going to have to go for high tech. Uh, the trouble is that folks are yearning to stampede back to the past, and it's as silly as the urge to, yearn, the ur the ur urge to go back to the womb. I, it's understandable. It is not possible. You can't go back there. The best you can do, maybe, is try and build a better womb and visit it regularly. Uh, take my daughter, for example, and the womb. My daughter was a 10 and a half months baby. She apparently got a sniff of the outside world and said, I ain't going. <laughs> and the ninth month came by, and then the tenth month went by, and well, I could understand and sympathize with her position. It was warm and comfortable in there, and uh, there were no news programs to annoy you. But uh, unfortunately, by now she had become mature enough to be born. And so it was necessary for her to be born, because if she was not, if she stayed there in the womb, she was going to drown in her own waste products. Not to put too fine a point on it, she had begun to shit and piss in there. <laughs> and if she hadn't finally made up her mind at the last moment, we were going to have to go in there and induce labor and get her the hell out of there. Well, I think of the human race uh, the same way. I think of the earth as a womb, with a fetus in it that is long past ready to be born and it is starting to drown itself in its own waste products because of its own fear and timidity. And it's time we got out there and, and inspected what God gave us, the 99.999999% of reality that is empty space. Um, very, very little of the universe is the surface of Earth-type planets. And unless we're going to spend all our lives huddling in corners and peeking through telescopes, we're going to have to go out and find out what it's like out there and how to live out there. Fortunately, it, as I say, it turns out not to be too difficult. We've just got a, a Christmas present from God this month. Uh, we discovered that Mars is soaking wet, that Mars is full of water, that if you were to sink a bucket near the South Pole of Mars and dig up a bucket of earth and then put it over a flame, after a while you'd have less than half a bucket of dirt and the rest would be full of water. There's that much ice buried there. We've got a virgin planet next door. I wrote a column about this in the Globe and Mail, and my email box filled up with emails saying, what would you want to go and despoil Mars for? Why, it's a virgin planet. Why desecrate a virgin? 
Well, if you, <laughs> as Louis Armstrong said, if you don't know, you got to ask, you ain't never going to know. Uh, I mean, did you want to remain a virgin? Why would Mars? <laughs> Fortunately, the virgin is soaking wet. And it's a good thing, I, for several reasons. For one thing, hearkening back to our earlier discussion of computers, I think by now we have all learned the value of backup copies. I think we need a backup copy of Earth, badly. Robert Heinlein said a long time ago, Earth is far too fragile a basket for the human race to keep all its eggs in. Uh, fortunately, as I say, it won't be too difficult if we use our heads. If you want to go there with big rocket ships, it's going to take a long time to get there and a long time to get back, and you're going to spend it cramped up in a little thing like this where you and your crewmates better, better get along very well for long lengths of time, and it doesn't sound very pleasant at all. But if you were to build solar sails, which we know how to do now, which we knew how to build 20 years ago, solar sails don't produce much thrust, they produce a lousy thousandth of a G, but it's what they call constant boost. It's like compound interest. It keeps on building and building. At a thousandth of a G, with a solar sail we could have built 20 years ago, if you headed to Mars today, making a number of simplifying assumptions, you could be there and back in 145 days. This is roughly the amount of time that it took the pilgrims to get to uh, Provincetown and uh, eventually Plymouth Rock when they realized there wasn't anything happening in Provincetown. Uh, curiously enough, although Pluto is 50 times further away than Mars, if you can get to Mars in 145 days with a with solar sail, you can get to Pluto in 145 weeks, only seven times as long to cover 50 times the distance. And that works down the line. Suppose you could boost your solar sail to a lousy hundredth of a G, you'd be there at Mars and back in 45.9 days, or Pluto in 45 weeks. Well, the 145 weeks is what a clipper ship used to spend on a round trip and make a fortune. Empires were built on clipper ships. How do you accelerate a solar sail to a, to a hundredth of a G or a tenth of a G? Well, the idea I like is the laser cannon. A friend of mine named Jordan Kerr, who used to work for Lawrence Livermore, which he fondly refers to as Larry's Rad Lab, sold me on the idea of laser cannon. Leave the engine at home where it's convenient to work on. <laughs> now, you aim the, solar, the laser cannon at the solar sail. It accelerates to whatever speed you like. You can even use it to help maneuver. Why is this of interest to Canadians? Where's the best place to put this laser cannon? Somewhere where we have sun in the sky for four months at a time. Somewhere up, say, in Iqalit or Nunavut or at Northwest Territories or the Yukon. We have the ideal situation for a laser cannon. Furthermore, the people who live up there know a lot more about living in Mars normal conditions than most human beings. <laughs> I see the, uh, the light is telling me that I'm running short of time now. So what I, I had some other things to talk about, but I'm afraid I'm out of room. I'm going to segue to a colleague of mine, one of my mentors and heroes, Theodore Sturgeon. Though his reputation is sadly in decline these days, Theodore Sturgeon was one of the three greatest science fiction writers that ever lived, and maybe one of the three greatest writers that ever lived, period. Uh, a man so great that I despair of telling you about him, except to say that all of his short work is being restored to print in a 10-volume hardcover series by Paul Williams, the same man who made Phil, Dick, Phil Dick's reputation, uh, by North Atlantic Books, and I enormously recommend each and every volume. Ted was a writer who, it's most common to say that everything he wrote was about love. Uh, that's the truism about Ted. It's surely true that uh, Ted wrote best when he was in love, which is unfortunate because he left a string of surly single mothers behind him across North America as he went. Uh, love came to him often, just not always with the same person. However, I think Ted, what Ted wrote about was not love so much as need, human need. I think Ted's own need was to persuade the post-Hiroshima generation that there is a tomorrow, there is a point to existence, there is a reason to keep struggling, that all this cosmic confusion is progressing toward something. And although he believed in his heart that this something was literally unimaginable, he never stopped trying to imagine it and never stopped trying to make it with mere words seem irresistibly beautiful. He persisted in trying to create what he called a new code of survival for post-theistic man, a code which requires belief rather than obedience. It is called ethos, he said. What it really is is a reverence for your sources and your posterity, a study of the main current which created you and in which you will create a still greater thing when the time comes, reverencing those who bore you and the ones who bore them back and back to the first wild creature who was different because his heart leaped when he saw a star. 
I would now like to read you one half page, forgive me, Moses, of the, the ending of one of Theodore's greatest stories, because it's very relevant here. It is a classic story called The Man Who Lost the Sea. And it has to do with a man who, when he was a boy, very nearly died learning the lesson that you always spearfish with a buddy. Even if you wanted to fish all to yourself, you do not spearfish alone. That I don't shoot a fish, we do. Now, the sea sound this man seems to hear is really earphone static, caused by the spilled uranium, which is killing him. And Ted writes, the sick man looks at the line of his own footprints, which testify that he is alone, and at the wreckage, the wreckage below, which states that there is no way back, and at the white east and the mottled west and the paling fleck-like satellite above. Surf sounds in his ears. He hears his pumps. He hears what is left of his breathing. The cold clamps down and folds him round past measuring past all limit. Then he speaks, cries out. Then with joy he takes his triumph at the other side of death. As one takes a great fish, as one completes a skilled and mighty task, rebalances at the end of some great daring leap. And as he used to say, we shot a fish, he uses no I. God, he cries, dying on Mars. God, we made it. Thank you for your sympathy.